everyone. If we're doing this correctly, we are now live with Rebecca Geller, Business, Legal, and Succession Planning During a Crisis. If you give me a minute, I'll take a chance to just let all the folks who are waiting for us get back in here. So let me go to the waiting room, as it were, and admit everyone that's, uh, that's been waiting to join us. And, and thank you for those of us coming through the Zoominar now. Um, it's great to see you. I'm not looking directly at you because I'm looking at the camera, um, but it's great to see you. Of course, we are all here today to talk with uh, Rebecca Geller for Business, Legal, and Succession Planning during a crisis. Uh, Rebecca is not just the president and CEO of her law firm. She's not just an award-winning attorney. She's also a mom of the year. More of that later. Uh, Rebecca, just tell us, how was your day? Happy to see you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. It's so great to be here. And I'm looking at some of these uh, names and faces and certainly know at least a couple of them. Uh, my, my day has been interesting. Uh, something I learned today that I did not know. You know, we all know that uh, toilet paper and paper towel and stuff are in uh, high demand during the pandemic time. But I learned today that apparently stand up freezers are also in high demand because my <laughs> freezer has died and I've spent half my day trying to track down a freezer and people have laughed at me saying, they are out of stock until at least August. So I have learned a lot today. If anybody has a lead on where to buy a freezer, <laughs> I'd be much thankful. Things I learned that I didn't know. Freezers, freezers and uh, dumbbells and barbells. You can't get those uh, as far as I know, at least last I checked. Um, that I actually uh, bought. I've had success with that, but freezer, uh, I have not. You'll have to tell me where you go, Rebecca. See, resourceful. This is what you need in an attorney. Um, that you're going to partner with someone that's resourceful we're, we're so glad uh, that you're here and the topic today is an important one we've already started getting media reaching out to us about this topic so we know at least uh, at least a number of people are interested and as folks have started coming in now i think i'm going to switch to my screen um, before we go to the big screen of the uh, just a four page sort of powerpoint slide a reminder to everyone that if you've got questions for rebecca go ahead and type them in the chat I will get them to her. Of course, we have some pre-planned questions, but um, if I see a question in the chat, the very next question will probably be your chat question because uh, we're so excited to hear from the people that are willing to come on here live and, uh, and really experience all that is the Geller Law Firm in addition to, uh, to what we're presenting. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and switch to live, um, switch to our new screen and here we go. If you came to business, legal, and succession planning during a crisis, you came to the very right event. Uh, welcome once again. My name is Jason Howell. I am president of our sponsor, the Jason Howell Company. And with that, we will go to our sponsor, the Jason Howell Company, and we will continue to let people in. Uh, Jason Howell Company is a family wealth firm. Uh, what we do for our families is equip them to become matriarchs and patriarchs, especially millennial and Gen X families that are really starting to grow into their own. We do that by equipping them with three tools. One of them is called a roadmap, very similar to a financial plan that you might expect, lots of recommendations, but then what do you do with that what? Um, well, our second tool helps you with the what. It's an implementation guide that really shows you how to prioritize all the recommendations you might get from a financial planner like us. Um, so we'll give you that and allow you to kind of work forward with that month by month so you know what you should be doing and when. But our third tool is something very unique to our firm. We create a family constitution in partnership with the principal, so typically the, the married couple, and we work through the past that they've had with money, the present that they're experiencing with money, and the future they'd like to have. So really it's a conversation around values, around ethics, very similar to an ethical will that you might have gotten from your estate attorney, like a Rebecca Geller. Uh, in this case, we're putting it together with the financial plan. So those are three tools. We call that whole process of putting that together family governance. Uh, and if you'd like more information about that, just go to jasonhowell.com. Okay, so the star of our show today. And it's the best way to start talking about a special guest is to read what other people are saying about her and her firm. You see things like fantastic first rate firm, dedication to clients, responsive, personal touch, uh, there's so much that one can say about Rebecca and her firm, and it is a firm. We're talking about at least 20 attorneys. Am I right about that, Rebecca? So we have 22 people, 14 of whom are lawyers, and I'm okay. actually hiring for number 15. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've got the pleasure of uh, attending many 
of Rebecca's holiday parties. And every time I go, there's at least one or two more hires. And so, you know, this firm started in 2011, but it's blasting off uh, much more than even some of the hundred year old firms. So really happy to, uh, to have someone of this status. And as I mentioned, award winning and to, to go to the award winning, I've got to actually read because there's, there is so much here. And some of this is from a few years ago, but obviously you can see on this slide, uh, Rebecca and her firm were featured in the New York Times for doing what a lot of firms have trouble doing, which is actually allowing their partners, their lawyers to have a life, um, which is exciting. And so that was a 2015 article from the New York Times. It was something that was a catalyst in part for her being invited onto Shark Tank, which because she's so busy, she turned down that opportunity. I remember when that came on Facebook and how you turned that down, uh, how many of us would turn down an opportunity to be on TV. Uh, I don't know, but Rebecca has, uh, has had to do that. Um, certainly Forbes Magazine has uh, recognized the Gara Law Group. And oh my gosh, what else has uh, come up here? Washingtonian Magazine has recognized Rebecca as a person you'd like to have dinner with, which I find interesting. Well, I uh, laugh at that one because I have three kids, so they clearly don't understand what dinner is really like at my house. <laughs> who knows? Maybe they're thinking if you can pull you away from your family, uh, that might be it. Uh, and speaking of the three kids, also mom of the year uh, from Washington Family Magazine. I don't know if you're uh, angling for mom of the year in 2020. It's such a crazy year. Um, and then Northern Virginia Magazine listed Rebecca as a top, fi top financial professional, which is great. And rising star super lawyers, if you weren't sure about what she did, they recognized her year over year over year, um, which is so exciting. So that's, that's sort of the resume. That's the awards. I met Rebecca about seven years ago when I was transitioning from corporate finance to personal finance. And uh, you know what? It's so hard to keep relationships over the years when we're so busy in the D.C. area. But somehow Rebecca and I have been able to keep that relationship I'm so thankful for that. I've learned just watching you grow and build your firm and the way you treat your clients that keeps them coming back. Um, Jason Howell Company aspires to be a lot like your firm, the Geller Law Group, and a lot like you, Rebecca. So welcome and thank you for being here. Well, thank you. And for those of you who have had the pleasure of working with uh, Jason, uh, he's such a terrific guy and runs such a great business. And we refer a lot of our clients over to Jason and they always are really uh, happy with the referral and feel like they get a uh, solid uh, financial advice and, and genuinely just enjoy working with him and his team. So uh, we, we love our partnership with you as well. Yeah, thank you, Rebecca. Yeah, it's so important to have a team of advisors around a family. Um, you know, a family isn't one person and, you know, financial and legal advice is typically not just one person, especially as, you know, you get further into your career and things get more complicated. So to adjudicate some of that complication, we've got some basic questions. And if you've got something maybe even more complicated, go ahead and put it in the chat and we'll see if we can pose it to Rebecca here live over the next 30 minutes or so. But Rebecca, the first question I have on here is just one that I think we should start with um, to just sort of get us into the room. What is business succession for a small business? It's thinking about the things that you don't think about. Um, one of the hardest parts of running a small business is that there are so many parts where you don't know what you don't know. Um, and my advice when I work with small business owners is to surround yourself with advisors, financial advisors, tax advisors, legal advisors, who will ask you the questions that you don't know to ask. Um, and business succession is one of those things that people don't really think about. Um, and it, it's been thinking about what happens if something happened to you, whether um, there was an injury and you were unable to continue running your business, um, if there was something that changed in your life and you had to move um, and you couldn't continue running your business from that locality. So, you know, perhaps it's a, a brick and mortar business that cannot be run online. Um, if there was an illness or a car accident, something unexpected, or, you know, right now in the COVID related world, people are going on ventilators and are incapacitated or God forbid dying. Um, what happens to your business and what happens to your loved ones um, who are left dealing with this mess if you have not planned for this? So there are a couple of ways that people wanna think about it. Uh, number one is just to make sure that your legal house is in order. Um, and one of the problems that we see so many times these days is that people um, are unaware of some of the holes in their legal foundation. 
a lot of this, I think, tends to come from the fact that uh, the internet makes it seem very easy to start and launch a business from the legal perspective, just using one of these online legal tools. Um, and one of the problems that I see is that many times the business um, gets canceled by the state corporation commission because uh, somebody mistakenly believes, oh, well, this online tool that I use to get started um, will take care of things. And then all of a sudden there were renewal has come up. They didn't know about it. I, I see this happen all the time, probably at least two to three times a month. We see somebody's business um, where there are problems where the business is in bad standing with the state or it has actually been canceled because they didn't know that they actually had to do things and the online company that they worked with didn't uh, inform them that there are continuing responsibilities. Uh, similarly, it's making sure you've looked at county and local requirements. When people create businesses online, some of those pieces get uh, overlooked. We get a client who was looking to us to sell her business you know, business succession is not just for if there's something bad that happens, but let's say you change your mind and you want to start a different kind of business or the business has done really well and you are ready to retire or you want to sell the business and start another business with the proceeds that you make from yours. Making sure that your business affairs are in order are key because if you don't have uh, the business structured properly. So let's say you have a business that has a lot of different arms to it um, and you want to just sell off one arm of that business. That actually can be pretty hard to do if you don't have it structured in a way that makes sense. How do you identify what actually is part of that business arm? So for example, I had a client who was selling her business and she came to us to sell her business, but she's been running it as a sole proprietor and was not running it as like an LLC or an S corp or C corp or anything like that. Those are very hard businesses to sell because you're not really selling an entity itself. You just are kind of operating a business under you as an individual. I had somebody else who did have an LLC. She wanted to sell the business and uh, retire. And we go in and look at her <coughs> on our corporate compliance. And turns out her business was canceled by the state a year ago. So we had to spend a lot of time and, and money re uh, bringing her business back to life in order for her to be able to then sell that business. The other thing I want to put on people's radar is when you are thinking about selling a business, you need, it's never too early to think about a plan. So, you know, we all think about life insurance and, and I hope people will think about wills and trusts and whatnot, which we can talk about in a few minutes. But what are the documents you need to have in place for your business to ensure when the time is right, whether there is an emergency or it's just the right time that you have planned, what are the documents you need to have in place? So for example, if you are an LLC, you wanna have, you know, LLC is limited liability company, that you wanna have your operating agreement in place, um, which is kind of like your business's bylaws or your constitution, if you will, um, that shows how this business will transfer. Um, you know, if you are married, a lot of married couples mistakenly believe, they think, oh, we're married, my husband can take care of these things for me. And the reality is that a spouse does not have that right to handle things for you, for your business, um, unless they are an owner of that business, which for many people, they're not. Um, and people mistakenly believe that. So putting in place like your bylaws, you know, for an S Corp or a C Corp, it's going to look very different than for an LLC, but making sure there's a plan. What if something happens to you and you're incapacitated? What happens to the business? And then if you are looking to potentially sell your business or even sell part of your business, many businesses are passed along to an employee um, or to a child, like an adult child. There needs to be a legal document in place that makes it very clear how this transaction is taking place and uh, you know the terms that go into it. So making sure those kinds of things are done in a thoughtful way. Um, almost 90% of family owned businesses do not survive to the next generation. And that's a terrifying statistic um, because there's no planning going into it. And so you have to think about these things long before there is a problem to make sure if something happened, you didn't expect that your business would be uh, salvaged or that it could be sold and that your family would receive the money from that business. You got two there, you got the uh, what it is and when should we start? The answer is we should start as soon as possible when it comes to succession planning. 
um, which is which is important and makes a lot of sense. You know, tell us, Rebecca, how is this? You know, these past few months we've all been experiencing. How has COVID nineteen changed your planning process, or maybe businesses that perhaps weren't thinking about it before, but now are? So I have never seen an explosion of interest and uh, uh, motivation to do this than I have in the last few months. Um, you know, since mid-March, uh, people who have never thought about creating these kinds of documents to authorize somebody to handle things for them, it's now on their mind. Um, you know, this is a scary time. Um, and here in Northern Virginia, we're entering phase three and things are looking better, um, but we all kind of know that there's a cliffhanger coming and there might be this really scary uh, second wave coming in the fall and in the winter. And so we want to make sure that, um, you know, we've had clients die a lot over the last couple of months um, and we want to make sure things are taken care of. So for, I'll give you an example of a story. Um, I had a client in DC um, and the husband was um, incapacitated. Um, and on a ventilator and could not talk, could not write, um, and but was alive and was conscious and was kind of just in this horrible limbo place. And he was the 100% owner of his business. And his wife was not on his business at name on the, any of the legal documents at all. And they had always assumed, oh, we're married. She can take care of things for me. Um, and the reality is that she actually cannot um, unless they had put together these documents. And so this poor wife was dealing with so many legal hurdles to try to get things taken care of, to get bills paid because she wasn't even on there as a signer for the bank account, um, nor should she be because she's not an owner of the business. But there are ways to make sure we plan for these kind of eventualities to make sure people are not blindsided by a problem that were to emerge. So the big thing I'm seeing is that there is a sense of urgency that people are all of a sudden realizing, hey, this is pretty scary and we need to make sure things are taken care of. Um, people are also starting to think about um, making sure their business will survive after them. That's not something people have thought about too much before. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of people are turning to the internet for this, um, you know, or they're having a friendly handshake saying, well, if something happens to me, um, then I will leave my business to you. I had a call with somebody about this recently. There was a small company, maybe 10 employees, and the owner had kind of a friendly handshake conversation with the employee that if something happened to the owner, he would leave the business to the employee. Well, you can't, or, or then he was saying, I, you know, I pushed back on this and I said, there needs to be a bit more than just a friendly handshake there. And then they said, okay, well, you know, I'll just give it to him now so he can own 50% of it. Well, that triggers a lot of tax issues and you can't just gift a business to somebody. Um, again, people are relying on the internet for a lot of this. And so they are creating these very template boilerplate kind of documents that will say, this is how I sell my business to you. Um, and they're really problematic. Um, is there a fair market valuation being done? Um, if you are thinking about bringing on a business partner, um, you know, a lot of people have been laid off and a lot of people are starting businesses or looking to get into a business. So if you're looking to bring in an investor or bring in somebody who could potentially take over your business down the road, um, that needs to be a very clearly written legal document. Um, and again, I think people People feel this false sense of security when they are working with, uh, you know, on these online legal tools and they feel that this is okay and so I don't need to worry about it. Uh, my recommendation is, uh, you know, if you are sick and have a serious medical problem, would you go online to solve that medical problem as opposed to calling or seeing your doctor? You probably would call your doctor. Same thing is true with these online legal tools. They are usually insufficient and can create much bigger problems. People ask me what I think a lot about these online legal tools. <laughs> you have no opinion. <laughs> you know, I kind of joke. I love them. I think they are great. I make a lot of money fixing problems caused by these sites. <laughs> so I'm, be yeah. careful. Be careful with them. And anyone who's got one of those documents, as, as I would tell any um, any current client or future client, and sometimes they ask, I mean, why can't I just use, and I won't even make, I won't even name them just to keep them under covers. But why can't I use some of these firms that are even advertising on TV, far less the ones that are online? You know, if you're going to use one, then at least go to a Geller Law Group type firm and say, hey, does this look like it's supposed to be right? Um, and maybe they'll give you a, just a couple hours of review on that and it'll be worth your time. You can't fix it when it's too late, right? And it's when you're dying or when you're ready to sell the business or whether you've, you know, something else has happened. And to that point, Rebecca, 
how do you see succession planning and estate planning going together? Well, I actually, can I ask if there's a question that came up on the chat? Yeah, there is. Uh, um, and you're right. And I, I should go to that. that. I I'll read it out loud for everyone. Um, my family is a third generation in a family business on the eastern shore of Maryland, but we know that the next generation will not take over the business. What are initial exit planning steps that I should be taking now with my parents? So I love this question. Um, and the, the, the issue here, so I'm licensed in Maryland. I do Maryland, DC, and Virginia. So I'm very familiar with Maryland law on this. And I work with a lot of businesses there. Um, and that one of the first questions is thinking about, um, well, what will that, what happened? You know, what is the idea? Is the idea that you're looking to get the business in a place where it can be sold? Um, and are you looking to try to find a buyer in the open market um, where you might work with a broker or something? I think the first question would be, what is the goal if the next generation and will not take over the business. There is value in businesses. People oftentimes think um, that nobody outside my family would care about this business. And the reality is there actually can be a lot of value in businesses. Um, so thinking about what your goal is, um, and once you've identified that goal, so let's say the goal is you want to sell it to somebody outside, or it's a goal that you want to just wrap it up at a certain point in time and just sell off the equipment or whatever is in it. Assuming the goal is that you might like to sell part of those businesses, um, that you would want to think about um, how the, what do you have in place? When somebody goes to buy a business, um, you have to do what's called due diligence. Due diligence is like, you know, when you buy a house, uh, somebody comes in and they do a home inspection and then the home inspection you can reveal, um, you know, is there a, a leaky roof and is there a crack in the foundation and do they need new windows. The same thing happens when somebody is going to sell a business. When you sell a business, there is due diligence where they basically the buyer comes in and they do an inspection of the business. Now that's a little bit different than a house inspection, but it means looking at your tax returns, uh, looking at your uh, any legal documents that may be in place. Have you ever been threatened with a lawsuit? Do you own your intellectual property? What kinds of contracts would be getting sold? Um, are there, is there an operating agreement that's in place for the business, if it's an LLC, for example? Um, so making sure that there is a lot of time and thought put into the place that, you know, are all of your local and county and uh, penalty compliance pieces in place? Because if somebody goes to buy the business, and, and I, I do a lot of this kind of work. If somebody wants to buy the business and they see that the, the, uh, the books are not in order, they're not talking just finances, finances, you know, contracts and intellectual property. Do you own, do you own the trademark for your business? If you don't own the trademark, that's a huge liability. So first making sure your house is in order and kind of spending some time and money getting things fixed up so it looks good um, and then looking at a potential buyer. So, and that takes time. That's not something that can just be done in the couple of weeks leading up to a sale, um, as well as making sure the business is running as smoothly as possible before it does go to a sale. Have you found sometimes Rebecca, and I've heard this anecdotally, by the time you get that business ready, it's very similar to getting a house ready for sale. Sometimes you look back and say, wait a second, now I want to stay here. I want to keep running this business. Have you run into that? Yeah, I have, um, where people are kind of questioning like, well, now that I actually have things organized, maybe it's easier to run the business and to stick with it. Um, but I also will tell you another story where um, I have had people who are, um, you know, buyers and they uh, don't do that due diligence. So if you're somebody who's looking to potentially buy a business um, and going into business, you have to do that due diligence because for, I've seen people who don't do it. We had one where she wanted to buy a business and she did not want us to do the due diligence. And I was very upset about it because huh. you just, I mean, I literally made her sign a waiver saying that um, we do not hold you liable right. for not doing this inspection. And it turns out that the seller, you know, had not run payroll and owed people money and hadn't paid taxes in two years. And there was a lien. And now my buyer is stuck in it and they both are suing each other back and forth. And um, it's terrible. And both of them are likely filing bankruptcy. So oh. um, it's a real problem. You know, oh. due diligence is an important step for the buyer and the seller there as well. Okay. Um, well, tell us about that succession planning and estate planning and, and how those are sort of interrelated. 
So my firm does, uh, you know, wills and trusts and estate planning as well as business law. And the two really go hand in hand because the question is how do your business finances and your business matters uh, coincide with your personal matters? So for example, again, you guys have sensed that I don't really like online legal documents, but a lot of people, somebody told me last week they bought a will um, and a trust off of Costco's website. I love Costco. I go to, co well, I buy things right now online from Costco and Instacart. Um, um, but, you know, I think Costco is great, not for a will and a trust. <laughs> and so um, it's thinking about how, what does your future plan look like? So for somebody who has children, um, thinking about, you know, you don't want to have a 10 year old inheriting your interest in a business. So how do you make sure that your interest in a business passes through to your loved ones in a way that is appropriate? Um, for many people, if you have a child, really, I say under age, like, 25 is kind of my cutoff, but it's kind of a, you know, in their twenties, um, that you need, I like this quote, that's the, the <laughs> comment here. Somebody commented, maybe they needed 30 estate plans in bulk. I love that. Um, so, uh, but you know, if you have a child and, and, and not necessarily a young child, somebody who is maybe, you know, 25 to, you know, 30 or so, um, you really don't, oftentimes don't necessarily want a 23 year old inheriting a business outright. Um, or perhaps the business would get sold and that person's going to inherit whatever money came from your business. So for a lot of people, they think, oh, well, my situation's really straightforward. I just need a will. The reality is you really don't. You really need a will and a trust. Um, and the kind of trust I'm talking about here is called revocable, a revocable trust, meaning that you can, it's flexible and it can kind of live and grow with you as your life evolves. And the benefit here is that you, if you do have a child or let's say you're leaving money to a grandchild or to a niece or a nephew or a great niece or something like that, um, if they are on the younger end, and I mean really like under 25, you don't want money going to them outright. If you only have a will, then that money goes to them outright at 18 years old. That business ownership would go to them outright at 18 years old. And generally speaking, most people don't want that. Um, they'd say, I, you know, maybe the business gets sold and they get that money, but I'd rather it go to them through a trust so that I can appoint a trustee and that trustee can be anyone. It could be my best friend. It could be my sister. It could be my financial advisor. It could be my lawyer. Um, but that trustee is responsible for distributing that money to my child until my child reaches a certain age. Um, you know, let's say that age is age 30 or age 40. Um, it can be whatever age you want. But the idea is that when they are younger, that money is available to them, but only for those specific things that you have designated. So when they're younger, basic living expenses, food, clothing, shelter, college, grad school, a down payment on a house, a wedding, their own kids, whatever it may be, um, to make sure the money is used for what you want it to be used for. The other big issue here too, is that a will by itself is oftentimes not enough to avoid probate. Um, and a business interest oftentimes deals with the, gets stuck in the commissioner's office with the estate administration, because a will is a generally pretty weak document by itself. And so for a lot of people, we want to make sure that your business does not spend a year in the county commissioner's office having to go through all the steps you have to go through if somebody does not have a really strong estate plan. So an estate plan is really, people ask me a lot, well, what does this estate plan thing mean? Um, they say, I literally talked to somebody on Monday and they said, I don't want an estate plan. I just want a will and a trust. I don't need an estate plan. I'm <laughs> right. like, Okay, but that is an estate plan. Right. So the estate plan is just the, I mean, I get that all the time. Um, the estate plan is just the umbrella term of what these documents are comprising. The will and the trust are big pieces of it. Um, you know, in the will, that's where you specify who the guardian would be if you have young kids of who's going to take care of your kids um, and who the executor is. But the two documents go hand in hand and they talk to each other to make sure that your business and that your real estate do avoid going through probate. Now, there's one other part of it, too, that we, we can't ignore. One of the really big pieces of estate planning is not just for end of life. It's also for while you are alive but incapacitated. And that's the power of attorney. Power of attorney documents are not a one size fits all. Again, don't download this from the internet. 
because you want to make sure that that power of attorney gives whoever you appoint the ability to handle business matters for you. Many times they don't include that. It might say this power of attorney authorizes my spouse or my uh, my best friend or my brother to handle my personal financial affairs. But what about my business financial affairs? So we want to make sure that you have a power of attorney that is broad and that includes these things. Now, the power of attorney generally can only go into effect in certain circumstances. So, for example, if you are incapacitated because you're under um, anesthesia or on a ventilator. Later. Um, or if you are having dementia, um, you know, that's something we see quite a bit. One of my least favorite conversations is when somebody calls me and they say, uh, you know, my mom is showing signs of severe dementia. I'd like to get a power of attorney now. Um, at that point, it's too late because if that person has lost their mental capacity to enter into a legal agreement, we can't just take away their rights by creating this power of attorney without them get, having that authorization. So we have to then go through the process of having somebody deemed to be legally incapacitated. And um, trust me on this, this is not something any adult child ever wants to have to do for their parents. Um, this is the kind of thing you wanna make sure you do long before there's ever a problem. So for people in this conversation, um, I recommend that you think about this issue about business succession as it relates to estate planning um, from two perspectives. One, and the perspective of you, you know, as the business owner, as you are potentially leaving things. But also, if you have parents alive, or if you are a caregiver of somebody who is older than you, you want to make sure you have that ability to help take care of them. Um, use today's webinar as an opportunity to have a conversation with them. Uh, you know, mom, dad, I don't want to inherit anything from you. I want you to spend your money, enjoy your retirement. You have earned it. But I want to make sure I have power of attorney to take care of you and help take care of things if in the future I need to. You want to have these documents done now, like before there is a problem, before there is an emergency. And, you know, similar to this, the same thing would be true for a medical directive. Uh, medical directive is the same idea as the power of attorney, except it's for um, med medical decisions. Um, and the two are very different. Um, many people think that they want like a medical power of attorney, but there are different kinds of documents. Documents, the medical directive says not just for end of life things, but while you're alive, but you are under anesthesia or on a ventilator, who makes these decisions for you um, and what kinds of decisions do you want them to make? Um, so that's kind of where I would say before I forget, by the way, just because I, um, I do see we are, um, you know, already about at least halfway through. Um, one thing I wanted to note, by the way, and I'm putting this into the chat too, um, is that I do offer a free phone consultation to anybody who has questions about these things that are specific to you. Um, so if you are interested in having a free uh, phone call about this, about something you don't want to necessarily ask in the big group, um, feel free to email me and we can set up a time to talk. Um, for those of you who are on Facebook Live, um, it is just my email is, is you can see my email at the underneath my picture here too. Um, but then I added my office one here as well. So feel free to email me if anybody would like to set up a time to talk. But um, I, I actually, types, yeah, it's pretty amazing. They, they do this all, all in one scoop. You didn't even skip a beat by putting that in the chat. Oh, I, I multitask and I actually saw um, I got a chat that was sent to me privately with a question. So would you like me to read that question and answer Please, it? Go right ahead. So the question, it's from uh, somebody on here who I know quite well. Um, so she said, referring to online planning, must all business documents such as a buy-sell agreement, partnership agreements, et cetera, be written according to laws of the state where the company is registered? So it's a great question. Um, yes. Um, so for the business documents, they do need to be specific to the state where that business takes, where the business is registered. Um, now, you know, that being said, the question is if you have a business that operates in multiple jurisdictions, you know, I have somebody who right now has a business that's in DC and Virginia, and they are selling just the, they're headquartered in DC and they registered as a foreign entity in Virginia. Um, and they are just selling off the Virginia arm of that business. So for that document, you know, I think it could go either way um, as far as which laws will govern, probably Virginia, but um, I think it could go either way there. Um, but the business documents, you know, your buy-sell agreement, your operating agreement, 
um, laws do vary. Um, Virginia is, is a very good state as it comes to uh, business law. Um, you know, a lot of people think they have to register in Delaware or Nevada. Um, Virginia is actually pretty good for small business owners as far as its laws. Um, so you do want to be state specific for these kinds of documents. And before we go, Rebecca, can you touch on maybe for 60 seconds or so buy sell agreement? You mentioned that I was hoping we'd get to it. And I think we should talk about it when we're talking about business succession. Sure. So the buy sell agreement basically says I, you know, I business owner, I'm selling my business to you as the buyer. Um, but I may not be the entire business. Maybe I'm only selling 5% of my business to you. Um, that happens a lot. Somebody is bringing on a business partner um, and they aren't quite sure how to do that. Um, one of the first questions would be, well, how do you value a business? Um, one of the most important things is making sure let's say your business is potentially worth $100,000 and the, you're selling 5% of the business to a potential business partner. So that business partner is buying into the business for $5,000 because that's their 5% ownership interest. So the first question is, how do you get to that $100,000 value to begin with? Um, so you need to do that in a very realistic way. Um, there are financial firms that do business valuations um, that can tell you, and there's a lot of different formulas out there that would say, this is how you value what the business is worth. And that needs to be a realistic value. Let's say your business is really should be valued at 2 million, but you don't really, you want to sell it to your son at a cheap rate. So you say, even though I've made $2 million last year, my actual value is a hundred thousand. So 5% of my business is 5,000. That does not pass my smell test. And that's where you start to have some questionable transactions in your books. And you really don't want to do that. So those numbers need to be pretty realistic there. Um, now, so let's say going back to my model, say it's a hundred thousand dollar business, and you're selling five percent to an to a buyer um, for over for five five thousand dollars. There are some different creative options you can do here. That can be a buy over a course of say five years. So it could be $1,000 they're buying in every year. So year one, they have bought in for 1% and they own it by five, paid for 1,000. Year two is 2% and they've paid an extra 1,000. It can be over the course of however many years you want. You can also get creative too. So once somebody becomes a business owner and they are that you know 2% owner, then the business owner would start doing business distribution. So they would pay out distributions from the business of you know, their profits, basically. You could also say, if I'm paying out a profit to this 2% business owner, and that profit is worth, say, $500, I could not pay that out, and it could offset their purchase price. So rather than them having to buy $1,000 this year, I'm actually just going to not pay out that $500 and they only have to pay $500 that year. So there's a lot of ways you can get really creative there, um, but the buy sell agreement needs to really flesh this out. Um, if somebody is buying the business completely, um, what is the role of the outgoing owner? Do they stay on as a consultant for a certain period of time? Um, some businesses will sell and they still will get a profit. You know, let's say you buy a business and they will get 20%, the, the, the selling owner will get 20% of the profits for the next three years. And maybe that's how they're getting the payout. Um, so you can get creative with it and rather than having all cash up front, but it needs to be well documented. Um, and the other thing too, is that some people like to do what's called sweat equity. Sweat equity means that I am buying into the business, but I'm not putting any money in. I am putting in my sweat, my time, my energy above and beyond what I'm getting paid for. You can do that, but it's very tricky and there can be some challenging tax questions there to make sure you're not evading tax problems. Um, so make sure, again, these things are well uh, drafted and really clearly outlined. Wow. Well, that's that's a lot of info. We went through so much stuff and I'm glad that you offered your uh, your time in the chat to talk. That, that typically happens when we have people in the Zoom and ours. Thank you, Rebecca. Of course, your email address is there. Everyone brace yourself. I'm going to stop the share. So, you know, big photo here of, uh, of Rebecca or myself, whomever is talking. Rebecca, before we go, is there just, you know, one item that you'd like people to walk away with for the, for the betterment of the community, the business community? Please don't do this or please do this and so that people like me can help you in the future. 
I think the big takeaway is to not be scared of tackling these issues. People get very overwhelmed when it comes to either working with a lawyer or even revisiting their documents. Um, and if you have drafted documents or an operating agreement or contracts in general, and you haven't looked at them in a while, same thing will be true for like a will and a trust. If you haven't looked at your documents in the last, you know, five, 10 years, you should brush them off and take a look at them because laws change things in society have changed and you want to make sure that your legal house is in order um, and it's not a scary process to do it that's one of the things i strive to move towards very very strongly is to make sure this is a relatively painless process for people that they can make sure their affairs are in order but it's not going to be this huge undertaking but it can be something that is done carefully um, and is done um, in a way that um, that is, is pro appropriate for your business. There's not a one size fits all, but you do need to stay on top of these things and you can't just stick it in a drawer and never think about it. Um, but that being said, thank you for, for inviting me to be part of this today. Um, and uh, it was great uh, talking with everybody in the chat. And we're so happy to have you. Rebecca Geller, President, CEO of the Geller Law Group, award-winning mom of the year uh, and many, many other things. Thank you for spending time with us. Um, of course, I will send your info out to the folks who registered and anyone who wants to get in touch with uh, Rebecca, you can find her at thegellerlawgroup.com. Thanks again, Rebecca. My pleasure. Thank you, Jason. Take care.